Hey everyone, today I want to talk about inflammation and heart disease. I want you to understand why it matters, see if you have some symptoms that indicate that you may have underlying inflammation, and make sure that you're being proactive to reduce it. Before I begin, I just want to introduce myself to those who don't know me. My name is Michelle Rothenstein. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in heart disease prevention and management through science-based nutrition. I'm here to ensure you're getting enough nutrients in your diet in the right amounts in order to protect your heart and prevent complications of heart disease. So let's begin. I'm going to start with sharing my screen so that you can see a couple of examples of what I am talking about. So there are six signs that I want to go over of that may be an indication for underlying inflammation. Because it's underlying, you may not necessarily equate this with inflammation. You may not even know that you have it um, unless you're connecting the dots. So if you are frequently sick, that can be a sign of underlying inflammation because when we are sick, our body has a pro-inflammatory response. And if it's struggling to recover and heal, it, if you have underlying inflammation, that's going to make it that much harder too for your immune system to kind of take boot out that virus that comes your way. So if you're frequently sick, if when you're sick, it lasts longer, these are signs that there might be some underlying inflammation preventing that ability for you to, for your immune system to kick in and make that virus or that illness go away. The second thing is fatigue. Oftentimes people will say, oh, I'm tired because I'm getting older. But when they start adding in nutrition, combating underlying inflammation, making sure they're getting enough nutrients, they're like, wow, I didn't realize that I was so sluggish. I didn't realize how much my energy improved because I tackled that underlying issue. So a lot of fatigue is another um, underlying inflammation uh, component or a symptom of it. Even acid reflux. So if you have a history of acid reflux or you have active acid reflux where you have to take protein pump inhibitors or Tums, that could be a sign of underlying inflammation because that sphincter that closes the stomach and the esophagus opens up and leads to acid to go into the esophagus, which can cause underlying inflammation. It can cause more of that systemic inflammation that we want to avoid. Other things like skin issues, psoriasis, eczema is a sign of underlying inflammation. It's your body's reaction to certain triggers. If you have stubborn abdominal weight or your weight is in the abdominal region, that is more metabolically active. It is pumping out these pro-inflammatory cytokines that can be contributing also to or being a sign of underlying inflammation. And I specifically say stubborn because if you have trouble losing that abdominal weight, more often than not, it's because there's underlying inflammation or insulin resistance not allowing for that to come be reduced. In my private practice, I see people who lose six inches off of their waist before one pound moves on that scale. So I really encourage you to be monitoring your abdominal weight and addressing underlying inflammation and insulin resistance. Another sign is joint pain. Um, a lot of times that joint pain can be arthritis, which is an inflammatory condition, um, and that can be a sign of underlying inflammation. So why does this matter when it comes to heart disease? I'm gonna talk about that while I really tell you that I want you to pay attention to your waist circumference. Before we go into the details of how this is correlated with heart disease, I want you to understand why that waist circumference measurement is so vital and so important. So oftentimes people assess their waist based off of their pant size, and that's inaccurate. Your waist, where we're really concerned in terms of visceral adipose tissue, is where your belly button is. So I want to make sure that you get a waist measurement, like a soft measuring tape, stand in a neutral position, don't suck in, don't suck out, and take those two ends and put them together. Um, and around your belly button, not your pant size, and assess where that is today as a baseline number. If you are a male in the general population, you want that to be 40 inches or less. If, it, if you are a female, you want that to be 35 inches or less. In certain ethnicities like South Asians, it's about two inches less in both men and women. So making sure you're also taking into the ethnicity component component of that as well. But measure your waist circumference. If it's out of range, we definitely want to be monitoring it very closely on a week or bi-weekly basis to ensure it's coming in the right direction. If it's in the normal
small range, I want you to assess your baseline so that every six months, every year, you're trending the waist circumference so that if it is trending in the wrong direction, then you know that that's a red flag, that there's inflammation brewing, and we need to address it from a heart disease prevention standpoint. Now, let me explain what happens. So if you have excess abdominal weight, what ends up happening is inflammatory mediators are being pumped out from that adipose tissue. It's very metabolically active, and that can lead to the systemic inflammation and insulin resistance, which then can cause damage in the arterial wall and cause more plaque to form in the arteries. Not only could it cause more plaque to form, it can cause the plaque that's there to become unstable, rupture, dislodge, and lead to a cardiovascular event. So we need to combat inflammation, whether it is from your waist circumference or it's from acid reflux or it's from inflammation in the gut from a different source. We need to address, is it there? And if it's there, how do we lower it by addressing it and adding in nutrients that are going to help reduce inflammation? There is a dietary inflammatory index that goes through a a lot of different nutrients and vitamins that we need to get from food in order to combat inflammation. And we need to make sure we're getting all of that through in a balanced way to lower these values. You can also, and I highly encourage that when you get a lab test, to check for HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Um, it's also known as cardio CRP in many lab tests, and that will test for underlying inflammation as well. There's also a GGT, there's also a fibrinogen that can also give us ideas of if you have inflammation and if ferritin levels are high, that can also be a source of inflammation along if homocysteine levels are high. But it sometimes all of these things are high. Sometimes it's just one. Sometimes it's a couple. So doing a comprehensive look at all of this is really going to help protect your heart. I also want to mention that there are many inflammatory conditions that increase your risk of heart disease because of the inflammatory component of those conditions. So if they're not managed, that can also lead to more of that plaque formation, more of that increased risk of heart attacks, heart failure, stroke, et cetera. And that includes having high uric acid levels, whether you have a diagnosis of gout or not, the acid reflux that we mentioned, the psoriasis we mentioned, fatty liver disease, arthritis, prediabetes diabetes, diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome. So anything that has an inflammatory component to it, that condition needs to be well managed and we need to be implementing science-based nutrition in order to really optimize your cardiometabolic risk profile. In order for you to follow a heart healthy diet, we really need to be personalizing it to make sure that it is sustainable and that it is something that you enjoy and that your body tolerates well. Um, so I'm going to stop my screen share here. The first step in all of this is understanding, do you have inflammation? And if you do, what's the source? Why is it there? Is it, the, is it a combination of the conditions that are not managed? Is it a combination of what you're eating, your environment, your lifestyle, your genetics? Is it a condition of that you may not realize? Is it because of high uric acid levels? So we need to do a little bit of understanding of the underlying root cause. And then we must implement science-based nutrition in order to reduce this, in order to protect your heart prevent plaque formation, prevent that plaque unstabilization that leads to a heart attack and stroke. I hope this was helpful. I hope you got a lot of information out of it. Make sure you follow me um, on YouTube. Make sure that you are also joining my email list and visiting my website at entirelynourished.com. I hope to hear from you soon and I wanna wish you a wonderful day. Be well.